for a while. Eric is assistant professor at the computer science department of George Mason University. He got his PhD from UCLA. He went to Johns Hopkins before that. And he's been working as a principal scientist at VeriSign before joining the George Mason. And at VeriSign, he worked on interdomain routing security, on large scale DDoS detection and defense systems for DNS attacks and uh, threats posed by name name collisions with the DNS. His talk today is on uh, DDoS and namespace management for ICN. Eric? Yes, thank you very much. So, hey everyone, um, I'm Eric. And uh, yeah, I'd like to keep the, the talk kind of conversational today. So if at some point someone has a comment or a question, you know, definitely feel free to stop me. And um, if it looks like something that I'm about to get to, I may sort of punt it for a moment. But uh, certainly I think having a back and forth would be probably the easiest way to do this. But um, without further ado, this is um, some joint work. Or this is a set of joint work with various of my collaborators. There's a whole bunch of them up there on the slide. But uh, this spans a handful of different things that we've written about, that we're looking into, but with kind of a, a common unifying theme. So two of the things that I think really sort of crystallize this theme are some DDoS mitigation that we think ICN is really well positioned to help with, and namespace management. So I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with ICN, so I'll do a little bit about what the sort of premise and the uh, sort of the, the substrate of ICN is. Um, it's a new proposed uh, internet architecture. And it's one of its sort of, some of its stated objectives are to fundamentally enhance both the scalability and the security of the internet itself. And its starting premise is that what we really care about on the network, at least these days, is content, is data, it's information, much more so than where we actually get it from. Um, so that means instead of worrying about when you want to transact with a service on the internet, where do you go to do that, um, which is an IP address, a service identifier, or whatever, you really care that you're doing something on the internet and it's information centric, hence the name. And of course, before worrying about anything else, security is built in as a first class concern all the way through. So there's been lots of discussions about security in the internet. And ICN doesn't treat this as a second order problem, it's a first order problem. So one thing that could pop into people's mind fairly is why focus on information? So information-centric networking says information is what matters for networking. Why? Well, one reason is content is king today. So there's a lot of different kinds of like content, content on the internet. You know, there's you know, a web page is content, maybe your email is content, but certainly one very popular form of content today is video. So video, I don't really care where I get the video from as long as I'm watching a video that I actually care about. If I'm gonna watch Mad Men, I wanna make sure it's the real Mad Men, but I don't really care where I get that from. So Netflix is actually responsible for 15% of global internet traffic today. Other estimates show that almost 58% of all traffic on the internet is some form of video content. So that means that like almost 60% of what goes across the internet today is this information that could be garnered from anywhere, you don't really care as long as it's the actual episode that you're watching. And what's even more interesting is that some estimates say that by 2022, 82% of what goes across the internet will be video. Again, this is just one type of content. It's one type of information. It isn't to say that NDN or ICN is only good for video, but it is really good for video, and that is projected to be maybe 82% of what we're sending across the internet in just a couple years. So there's other reasons too. So you know there's a growing trend for uh, for protocols and services to be very edge to edge. So I might send a message to someone that's near me. Now whether that bounces through a central server or not, I don't really care. I really care that I can send a note to somebody. So my service model is really edge to edge, regardless of how you've implemented it. Um, and more and more as we've built innovations and we've built things uh, these days they don't really need the centralized service. Beyond just being edge to edge, if there is a centralized service, at this point, people don't really even have to know about it. So that includes chat, like we just said, file sharing, and cloud nominally is, is, uh, fits that bill as well. I don't really care where the cloud is, that's why it's called cloud. So underneath all this, ICN has a lot of, um, has a lot of uh, ICN is very interested in a lot of this, but 
the way ICN is designed, names are very critical. They are nominally one of its most critical building blocks. And I'm going to wind up talking on a lot about that today. So first, so on to that, some IP versus ICN um, architectural basics. So I don't know how many people here have seen the sort of thin waste model of the internet, but you know this is something that's been coined from way back, which is basically what allowed the internet to become wildly successful is it aggregated or accreted a whole bunch of networks. So when networks were sort of separate and then IP came along, IP became this thin waste because you had a whole bunch of uh, protocol heterogeneity down below at layer two, nominally at layer one as well. And you had a whole bunch of services and transport ideas above. You had you know, TCP, UDP, you had SNMP, RIP, HTTP. You had a whole bunch of different things you wanted to do above. But by having one common protocol that unified them, you could accrete your networks and create a network of networks, which became the internet. And so that was coined the thin waste. Of all the protocols fanning in and out, you had one in the middle. And so with ICN, or one of its variants, NDN, name data becomes that thin waste. You know, if you have a name, then you can go and get the content. And the strategy that you use to get it, the transport or the network protocol used to get it, isn't really important. It's important that you get that information, that you get that content, that that name maps to what you're looking for. So names become this new thin waste, this new very critical architectural substrate for us. So this is kind of a, a brief outline of what I'll talk about. So that was just kind of like level setting. Um, I'll do just a really brief sort of like introduction to some elements of ICN just so that we understand uh, sort of shared context for the rest of the talk. Then I want to talk about um, how we can use ICN to tackle in a near term way some of the biggest problems that face the internet today and one of them being DDoS. And then I'll talk a little bit about how today's internet can help tomorrow's future internet architecture with ICN by some synergy between the two of them. So just pause momentarily for any comments or questions, any rocks or tomatoes. OK, well, um, I have thick skin. So if, if something doesn't make sense, please shout it out, because it's probably I just said it wrong. OK, so something that hopefully seems relatively common to all of us, IP architectural. So here's, here's a service model for what I think we're used to today. So you can see on the top left, I've got a content server sitting inside a service provider network. And in the middle, I've got sort of a routed core. I've got a bunch of, bunch of internet service providers. Then they've got some router topologies. Um, then I've got some access networks on the top and along the right side. Maybe I've got like a home access network at the top and maybe an, an industrial control system network with a bunch of IoT devices on the right. And at the bottom, maybe I've got like a wireless carrier with a whole bunch of cell phones. And obviously, super simple model for the internet today. So today, if one of these mobile phones wants to transact with that server, get some content from it, they send a, a request all the way across the internet. The service provider sends a response back with the content in it. Phone's happy. Neighbor wants to do the same thing, sends the same, sends the information all the way back out to the same content. Maybe it takes the same path, maybe it doesn't. Response comes all the way back. Then maybe an IoT device wants to get that same content all the way back. IoT device again, same thing, all the way back. You can see maybe these this home access network, there's a bunch of requests at the same time. And before any response comes back, they're banging on that server. And you get the idea. That's a lot of redundant traffic and transactions at that service. And so basically, you've pushed the load all the way up to the content owner. And there's really nothing that can be done about that. So let's contrast that with an ICN architecture. So ICN, first one connects, sends an interest, comes back with content. But now the content's cached along the way. So now, if a neighboring element, another device, wants to get that content, it's just one hop. Maybe if an IoT device then wants to do the exact same thing as before, content gets cached on the way back. And then it services locally. And then if a whole bunch of uh, elements request at the same time, they're still all served by one content provider or one cache content. No, this, this work is not correct. No? Three links, three interests down, there should be only one because there is an aggregation in that That's area. true. That's a good point. That's right. There's two, two extra things. arrows in there. That's right. OK. Someone was paying good attention. That's true. But how's the rest of it look? The rest of it's right. 
All right, cool. Okay. So maybe like 80, 98 <laughs> percent. I'll take it. But what we can say is that the traffic has been pushed now to the edge. So now the demand is where we see. So those that are issuing the demand are now the ones that uh, have all the content by them. So that's where all the traffic is now, right next to all the content requesters. And that's great for apps that need content at the edge. It's great for a lot of things, but it's a fundamental architectural advantage to an ICN. So there's a, there's a famous proverb, I put this into more talks than I care to admit, but to know the redhead, ask those coming back. So ICN architectures uh, have a lot of um, attractive features. Um, and, but one of the things we can say about today's internet is it's proven to be evolutionary, evolutionarily resilient. In other words, it's had to grow up a lot. It's had to do things that weren't initially envisioned. And it's, uh, various pieces of it have done a very good job of adapting. And that's not something to ignore. In fact, that's something that would be to our peril to ignore because coming up with a brand new architecture that doesn't learn from the past is probably doomed to repeat it. So in this talk, I'll talk about some tangible near-term benefits that we could see from ICNs and some important aspects that today's internet has to offer ICN. Okay, so I'm gonna move forward to probably the sort of the fireworks part. Any comments or questions before I do? Okay. So, can ICN help us today? And if so, how? Well, so in addition to a lot of the other things that ICN is good for, one tangible thing that it is immediately good for, I, we argue, is preventing DDoS attacks. So we have some recent work that's, um, that's uh, about to be published um, about the last 20 years of DDoS. So DDoS is 20 years, bot-born DDoS, robot network or botnet DDoS is 20 years old this year. Happy birthday, DDoS. And so um, using ICN, we actually, if you, <laughs> we, we think that ICN gives us the tools now, today, to deploy things that can squash some of the largest DDoSs that we currently face operationally in the internet today. But first, let me tell you a little bit about DDoS, just because uh, it's important to understand the nature of the beast that we want to face down. So the, the status of DDoS is we are losing ground. We are losing ground to attackers for a bunch of reasons. DDoSs are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They're being launched from devices that are just increasingly easy to get access to. It's easier and easier to acquire, attack, or throw weight from devices that have incredible network capacities because of where they're hosted and increasing processing capacities because they're getting smarter. And you know, there was a recent talk by Craig Labowitz, who's got a long, long history in the DDoS world, going all the way back to Arbor. Um, and what he observes is basically when looking at our carrier networks, he says, attacks are growing faster than our network growth. In other words, the miscreants are getting more throw power than our networks are. So, oh, I forgot to fix that. The rising tide. So DDoS attacks are growing and growing. And in 2015, DHS announced a program, DDoSD, which was the DDoS defense program. And it was aimed at asking for innovations that could one day protect against um, DDoS attacks that got to be as large as one terabit. Because at that point, they were nowhere near that big. And then in 2016, Krebs on security got slammed with a massive DDoS attack that was almost that big, way bigger than anything before it. And then later that year, IoT devices and closed circuit television um, devices were leveraged to smash OVH with a 1.1 terabit attack, already exceeding the magical number of one terabit that was foreseen. And then later after that, in 2016, Dyn got knocked over by a 1.2 terabit attack from the Rai botnet which was using IoT devices as well. In other words, IoT really became the vector that we had to worry about for the largest DDoS attacks that we have ever seen, had ever seen. They've only gotten bigger since then. So today's state-of-the-art remediation, we use mitigation providers. We use big companies that provision lots of network capacity, companies like Akamai, Newstar, Cloudflare, and a bunch of others. And they build these really, really big networks. And 
They provision enormous capacities there. They go and they buy lots and lots of transit. They try and put their um, data centers in lots of places around the internet, around the world, so that they can sync traffic as close to the sources as it can. And they build a lot of deep packet inspection, build in, into appliances, they build their, their own custom software. And their job is to take in attack traffic, these massively provisioned mitigation centers, and what they call scrub it. They look at which of the traffic is attack traffic and which of it is good traffic. They try to pass the good traffic on to the actual service provider while dropping the bad traffic. So scrub away the bad traffic. So they're called scrubbing centers. But this still leaves the attackers with the advantage. So even while our providers are trying to spread their footprints out, even while they're trying to pay tons and tons of money to provision massive amounts of network capacity, it's really, really hard for them to keep pace with free, readily available attack infrastructure that's highly distributed. In other words, if you're paying for terabits of, acts of network capacity in your scrubbing center, and that's terabits in the aggregate, that means that like, I may have to get to a terabit by stitching together a bunch of gigabits or hundreds of gigabits around the world. That means that none of my data centers themselves may take a terabit attack. That means they can't. So if I'm going to be paying for terabits and distributed footprints all around the world, then how is that going to be able to compete with free? Which is what, my, which is what the miscreants are able to deal with. So that doesn't even touch on the fact that now what we're seeing from DDoS is the techniques, tactics, and procedures, the TTPs, are moving up above the network and the transport layer. They're now becoming application level semantics, which means my deep packet inspection needs to get smarter and smarter and spend more and more processing in order to actually scrub traffic. It's getting, not only are the DDoS attacks getting bigger, it's getting harder to actually mitigate them per packet. In short, this is an impedance mismatch. It's just not fair. It's a lot easier for, it's getting increasingly easier for them to attack us than it is for us to defend. And what we need is a way for our DDoS countermeasures to be as distributed topologically and in processing as the attackers are. And what we love about ICN is it reverses this impedance mismatch. So now, in facing DDoS, what we've always thought is the network should be our greatest defense. And it's just been really hard to do that. But in ICN, that's exactly what it gives us the ability to do. We can use the network as our greatest defense. So now what we want is we can see when a DDoS happens, we want to squelch it as close to the attack sources as possible. And in fact, and that, that's for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is as the attack traffic, let's say our mitigation scrubbing centers are able to handle the load that they're going to come under. That still means I have to backhaul that traffic to the scrubbing centers. They're never, by definition, going to be at the attack source. It's not going to be on the IoT device. It's going to be somewhere hopefully close to it. But as the attack traffic traverses the internet to get to a scrubbing center or anyone else, there's collateral damage. If, for example, an ISP or an IXP gets overwhelmed by the attack traffic, which has happened, then anyone else that's sending other traffic through that link is going to suffer because that link can't support that additional traffic. So that's called collateral damage. But the thing is, this setting of getting the network to do our work for us, to mitigate for us, that's exactly what ICN is good at. It's exactly good at pushing things out towards the requesters. And what we do is we want to push remediation out, just like ICN is good at pushing content out. So we look at specifically among the ICN variants that could be talked about, we look at name data networking, we look at NDN. And NDN's a prime exemplar of ICN. You know, it's implemented, it's incrementally deployable. You know, it's one of the sort of the premier ICNs, you know, but it's got a lot of tremendous properties. And so, as I mentioned before, names are critical in ICN and NDN. So, you know, I'm, I'll sort of go over the namespace real quick. This is just a toy example, but the names in, in NDN are part of a hierarchical namespace. So there's a slash at the top that's a root. So for example, I might have slash provider and then a path to some data and then like a chunk of data in its name. And then I might have this, a separate piece of data with the same provider, so under the same part of the namespace, but then under a separate path and it's another data name. And then I, under the root, I might have another provider, another path, et cetera. So basically everything comes down like a Unix file system from a central root. And 
NDN clients acquire content by sending out interest. They beacon out, I'm interested in some of this data, and then the network, or, and so that will reach a content author, and then the network will respond by caching, sort of like we saw earlier on. So how do we use NDN to combat DDoS? So here I have the exact same topology that we saw before. And what I'll say is that NDN has built-in DDoS avoidance. It's caches. So NDN's nature all by itself is that if you want to bang on a provider by asking for content over and over again, you're not going to be able to. Miscreants can't bombard the service. So for example, let's say in this network now a bunch of my devices are compromised. And so now the first one's going to go, and the first one probably can send an interest and get that content server to respond to it. But then it's cached like we saw before. And so the neighboring miscreant doesn't get to hurt the server. And the IoT doesn't really get to hurt the server either. It can transact with the network a little bit, but then it's cached, and all of his neighbors are very unhappy after that. So NDN is already DDoS resistant. But there is still an attack vector where miscreants can send interests and bombard the content server with interests. So that's an existing attack vector, whereas a lot of what you would expect a miscreant to try and do to bang on someone in NDN doesn't work. There are still ways that a miscreant can make a content provider's life miserable in NDN. And so that's the subject of our, our work. And so we come up with an idea called fine-grained interest traffic throttling, or FIT. And what this does is it basically overloads some of NDN's control traffic. I didn't really get into this. Um, it's, it's in our paper, but basically there's a knack in NDN that we can overload when a content provider sees in a flood of interest that it thinks are a DDoS, it can instruct the network to go back to those sources and squelch them. Tell them that's enough, or this is the rate I'll accept for you from now on, and the network will take care of it from there. So what this does is it plugs that remaining DDoS attack vector that exists in NDN today. It uses the network to push these remediations all the way out to wherever the attack sources are. And this has kind of been one of the, um, the sort of the goals of the DDoS market for a long time is how do you get your remediations closer and closer. And what's interesting is that IoT security is a well-covered topic throughout, the, throughout everywhere these days. People know that IoT devices are a big problem. They're causing the biggest attacks. They're rampant everywhere. They're on these high provision networks. And no one can stop people from pushing out compromisable devices, whether it's because of weak passwords or because of bad coding practices. So there's a lot of there's a lot of work that says we've got to raise awareness. We've got to instruct people to do a better job. So there's a bunch of NIST documentation on that. There's you know the OWASP. It, you could basically, if you Google this, you'll get reams of websites about how do we get people to do a better job of programming IoT devices. But what's interesting is our approach is a bit different. So again, how can this help us today? So we think that the network should be doing a lot of the work. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get IoT devices to be coded more securely and they shouldn't use default passwords. But separate from that, we believe the network can stand right in front of these devices and make a foundational difference to the problem. So because NDN is incrementally deployable, NDN can be deployed on top of today's internet. So here, it's basically an overlay service. So the top picture shows a sort of a sample overlay, but really the bottom picture shows you really don't even have to have an overlay. You can have a service provider, and you can have those service elements that the provider has, has issued. So what I mean by that is, imagine that there is an IoT, um, develop, uh, an IoT company. They produce devices, and they use an NDN stack. Now maybe behind the NDN they are used to doing IP and they've got their own code and maybe there are vulnerabilities in there, maybe there's default passwords. One, if that device is configured to speak to its mothership, through to its cloud, to its service provider over NDN, then how is a miscreant going to probe that device in order to compromise it? But let's say they do, which is already a high bar, and they compromise that device and now they're on that device. Now what are they going to do? That device only knows how to speak NDN. It may transact over the IP internet because I buy that device and I plug it in at home and my, my cable modem speaks IP, but that device doesn't know that. That device only knows how to speak NDN. So now that device is no good to anybody's Mirai botnet or anything else because if they were even able to compromise it, they are not able to use it or leverage it in any kind of attack. So now, without asking for a forklift upgrade, 
of the network. I don't have to deploy new routers. I don't have to deploy new protocols throughout service providers. I can do this from end to end. And I can take out all of those devices that would be participating in large scale attacks. And of course I want them to code their stuff securely, but now the network is doing its job too, whether they code securely or not. Any comments or questions? So for this uh, incremental deployment, you need end end just at the uh, gateways, at the mm -hmm. edges of the mm -hmm. uh, network, right? Yep. And it would get better with caches in the middle, but it doesn't need them. Right. Just having them on edge gateway, that's all you need to help with the uh, DDoS. Yeah. If you teach those devices, they can only speak NDN and put a gateway in front of them. Right. They're good. So edge gateway is a cloud. No, the edge gateway would be on-prem. So Cloudflare, oh, you mean like the role it plays? Uh, depends what you mean. So Cloudflare does so many different things, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to tell what you mean by cloud. You have three NDN nodes in the bottom right picture. Yes. So are you saying it's, it's like the CDN company need to deploy those three? No, that would be like your devices. That would be like something like right in front of your refrigerator. So you want the home routers to have to do it. So that's a three blue routers is actually it could be even inside your home network. It doesn't even have to be the home router. Certainly, it could be the home router, but you could basically say, if you wanted to build an IoT device, you could build it to speak IP and then have an NDN gateway right in front of it on the same device. This basically just says, put NDN as close to that device as possible. Yes. Well, what if the, that router is compromised? Certainly, at any point, if something is compromised, that's a problem. So if you want to worry about it, encapsulation, you would have NDN at multiple stages. So yeah, ideally, you'd have your home router do NDN, speak to your NDN appliances. You have your NDN appliances speak NDN themselves. The more you deploy this, the tighter it gets. But the beauty of this is on day one, you can deploy it just on that device. And that device is harder to compromise and harder to leverage if it is compromised. But yeah, nothing's perfect. And it's a fair question. So, okay, are we there yet? So, NDN, Manfit, they present near-term deployable solutions. But it turns out that in the internet, there's more to operationalizing infrastructure than just these technical issues. So, we have a lot of confidence in this work, but we also recognize that this is the starting point of a bunch of important discussions. So now, I'll sort of pivot the, the presentation a little bit. I'll pivot it over to what is today's internet look like as far as, um, as as a substrate to help tomorrow's internet. So like I said before, one of the linchpins, or maybe the linchpin, depends who you're talking to, of, of an ICN is its namespace. The names are critical. But what we've seen from the internet's history, the decades of it, is that um, this, that, that this is an extremely complex matter. It involves technical details, policy details, monetary considerations, legal disputes, and on and on and on and on. So the DNS domain name system is not ICN, but it is the internet's de facto name system. And it's evolved a very robust ecosystem to deal with a lot of these complexities. And so we have some other work that we've published in ICN this year that basically proposes that today's internet has something to offer ICN, which is actually the management of its namespace, and we call it NDNSSEC. So let me just go a little bit into some of the aspects of naming that become very complicated, because I think a lot of people are used to thinking it's pretty straightforward. So at a high level, in internet, naming is basically the mapping of a namespace to content. But with respect to how to manage names, it was coined by Van Jacobson, the network had better not care how you do it. So in other words, the technical aspect of how you actually manage names in your network shouldn't care how you actually map what name goes to what content. And I think, indeed, we agree with that. The mechanisms in NDN, are, they do a great job of handling the namespace and attaching the content, using signatures, et cetera, um, focusing on the technical issues. But what we argue is that there's still a very demonstrable, if not separate, need for management of the namespace. True, NDN and ICN are not DNS, but as the sort of 30 plus, plus years of 
de facto use in the internet, what we ask is what can we actually learn from the successes that it's had. So if people, some, some people are probably very familiar with the NDN literature. So you could say, wait, isn't that what NDNS does? It already exists. Or maybe even CCN KRS. Didn't they already do this? Isn't this already done? Like, what are you guys doing here? In other words, haven't, haven't, this, haven't you already addressed this? Other people? So yeah. Regarding a lot of the technical aspects, there is a lot of thinking that has gone into how to manage the namespace technically. There's a Sudsy approach, self-certified names, trusted third parties, lions and tigers and bears. There's lots of work that's gone into this technically. But also, no. Regarding policy and technical aspects, you know, things that you are concerned about or will be concerned about under successful scenarios are trademarks, legal disputes. And in fact, the operational and industrial ecosystem that exists today needs these things to have remediations because names matter. And I'll underscore that. So there's going to be growing pains. So mapping names to content, very critical. I'm not trying to elide that. I'm not trying to minimize that. It's absolutely critical. And securing that mapping is a first order requirement in NDN and ICNs. And scaling is important, et cetera. All this stuff is very important, but that's just not what I'm talking about here. So consider this. If NDN or ICN is going to be broadly adopted, it's going to need industry buy-in. I mean, you're going to want the industry. You're going to want people to build companies on top of it. You're going to want people to use it. Lo love it or hate it, it's what makes something successful in the internet. And history's taught us that there are a lot of non-technical considerations that become very, very important. Like I said, trademarks, intellectual property, lawsuits, etc. And the industry has long since coupled DNS domain names to like property of value. And in fact, what's interesting is recently there's actually been some sort of the, the tail has wagged the dog a little bit. A lot of these technical or a lot of these policy concerns have wound up with technical security um, exploits. So that's a lot of the name collisions work that I've done where, you know, a technical execution of a name resolution all works just fine. But because I'm pointed at the wrong namespace and someone else got the answer, I get to get really upset. So there winds up being sort of like a cyclic relationship. So technical becomes part of a good policy management framework. So I've kind of taken the internet phone book here. Uh, I've taken the DNS to be the internet phone book and just kind of diagrammed the two pieces that are involved. So the way we look at this is the, how entries are entered and read from a phone book, like is there actually there? That's the technical aspect. That's like for the DNS, that's what we have the IETF for. But how to decide what names get to get in there and, and how the phone book is actually structured, that's what we have something called ICANN for. And it tends to be very, very contentious. In other words, I wouldn't assume that it would just handle itself in the future. So why did we wind up needing this for DNS? Well, first, it seemed like maybe we didn't. Maybe, you know, it sort of seemed like the IETF would handle the technical protocol and it would all be fine. And then the names became very business critical. And suddenly, it seemed like you know the internet needed something. And after enough like demonstrated need, the DNS community evolved something called the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, an organization and a community designed to help manage the policy aspects. Now, is that perfect? No. But there's a quote: "Those who cannot remember the past are, but maybe we should say maybe condemned to repeat it." So let's take a look at the past. I like these slides. The student did these slides. They're great. So here's a timeline and the growth of domain names in the DNS. So in 1983, RFC 882 basically started to discuss concepts of domain names. In 1987, Paul Makapetris wrote RFC 1034, the canonical start of DNS in the IETF. And at that point, we had like about, I guess, according to the numbers, we found about 1,000 names in the DNS. So then in the early mid 90s, there started to be a lot more names in the DNS. I mean, dot com boom sounds like the, the bubble, but the bubble happened later. But anyway, you can see there's a lot more names in there. So in 1994, RFC 1591 said it's up to the requester to be sure he's not violating anyone else's trademark. This is a technical problem. If you've got other concerns, take care of them yourself. We don't really care. 
1996, a court ruled in Germany, domain names are comparable to telephone numbers, bank routing numbers, and postal codes. So suddenly, the law is starting to get upset. Then, in 97, another court ruled that domain names indicate origin and can be related to natural and legal persons. So now we're starting to worry about like PII and privatization of DNS. Suddenly, this is becoming much more than we expected. So in 1998, NTIA published the ICANN Green Paper. Said, you need to start something called ICANN. In 1999, ICANN launched the UDRP. This is the dispute resolution resolution process. This is if you've got a complaint about somebody stepping on your toes, here's how you manage it. And you can see that suddenly there were a whole bunch of legal disputes put before the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, people complaining about people stepping on each other's rightful property. So then in 2003, RFC 3467 says, increasing commercialization of the internet and visibility of domain names that are assumed to match names of companies or products has turned the DNS and DNS names into a trademark battleground. Definitely seems to be borne out by those numbers, thousands of cases before WIPO. In 2006, RFC 4367, there's been a strong demand to acquire names that have significance to people through equivalence to registered trademarks, company names, types of services, and so on. There is a danger in this trend. Talk about truer words never being spoken. So. Hopefully that gives you a sense for why it is that maybe there needs to be a policy function somewhere, somehow. So when ICM becomes successful, will we have similar or maybe even the exact same problems, i.e. will the past be prologue? And if so, what can or should we do? So we could punt, we say it's probably not going to happen or it'll probably work itself out. Maybe we've all learned a lesson and we're just you know, nicer than we used to be. Or maybe we can leverage a solution that exists without changing our technical innovations. Remember, the network had better not care. So we don't want to go and change the way we do our technical innovations because of this. But we think, yes, we can. We think we can have our cake and eat it too. We think we can synergize the technical designs that NDN and ICNs more generally have with a separate policy function. And that's where our proposed solution, NDNS set, comes in. So in this proposal, we sort of broadly classify namespaces as a set of names from which all names for a given collection of objects are taken. We discuss our namespace management as a decentralized scheme that partitions the namespace into management units. We use the word zones again, just like the DNS, in which are owned and maintained by authoritative entities. So here's an example. Here's the canonical DNS. There's the root, there's a couple top level domains, and there's IETF org, a second level domain under org. And down there, there's a couple records that are in the zone. There's a mail exchange record so that people can get in arguments with each other over email. There's an IP address so that people can look up documents so they can get in arguments with each other over email. And here's what we, we imagine our namespace look like. We have a namespace new. We divide it into a set of zones, Z, where each zone, ZI, has a zone owner. And that zone owner's job is to authorize some number, some set of producers to create content, and those producers will then put content, will publish it. So let's go back again to the, here's the DNS namespace that we saw a second ago, but now there's a third level domain, tools.ietf.org, and we've blown out an example of um, the DNSSEC records that might be there. So you can see that there's a signature record that verifies that this set of records is integral, and below that there's a a zone signing key, below that there's a key signing key. So these are just part of DNSSEC records for the zone. So now we project this zone into an NDN namespace. So now we've replaced the label separators from dots to slashes. So we've got a root slash, we've got slash com slash org, slash org slash IETF, slash org slash IETF slash tools. We've NDNified it. So in this setting, we would have a producer. The producer would create a public-private key pair and would submit the public portion to the zone owner. And the zone owner would then enter that into the DNSSEC zone. So here, what we've imagined in the first rev is that we'd make these DNS key records, but we'd update the flags in various fields to indicate that they're not like zone signing keys or key signing keys. They're to be used separately, but they exist in the zone. 
So then this producer may create some data. So here this producer has created slash HTML slash RFC 882. So they want to write, they want to publish the RFC that started the domain stuff. And they'll add a prefix to that, which is the namespace under which that NDN content is going to go. Slash org slash IETF slash tools. Then they'll sign it with the private portion of the key that they've previously entered the zone. And then they'll register it. They'll put it out in NDN. Later, a consumer will come along, and the consumer will come will first retrieve this packet. They'll want to know what started the DNS stuff in the first place. They'll go and they'll get the key out of the DNSSEC zone so that they can verify the signature on it. So what this does is it basically lets us have a collision-free namespace in which no one else can claim to be IETF.org. That's managed by ICANN. That's protected. So one of the things that we could worry about is down the road someone were to come along and they'd say, I want to create a, a new company that does something called you know, eating, and my company is going to be called Apple. But that name's already taken. But that's OK. I'll just publish it as slash Apple. People will figure it out. It'll be different. That will be arbitrated and fixed by this. You would have to have your content under some domain name that you're the rightful resource holder for, and there'd be dispute resolution. In other words, people won't be able to have name collisions. So evolving from IP to ICN. So what we found here is that there's a great deal of synergy to capitalize on. So this is sort of up-leveling to all the stuff I've talked about. I think there's a lot of synergy between what we, where we want to go and where we are today. Um, I think the fact that ICN is built on top of names as a thin waste is actually brilliant. And I think it also gives us the opportunity to leverage the things that have scaled and made a number of aspects of the internet successful today and continue to let them be enabling for us in the future. So um, our research roadmap is basically this. So where we are, we've identified real world needs from ICN. So I've spent a lot of time with a lot of cybersecurity stuff. And so one of the things I spent a lot of time on was DDoS. And I think that it's great that we have a preliminary design for how we can actually combat some aspects of some of the worst DDoS um, vectors in existence today with NDN. So we have this DDoS prototype. We have a bunch of simulations. And we also have this, what I just said a second ago, a policy mechanism to help make the namespace more palatable to those that might want to adopt it. I mean, I think one of the things that we maybe haven't run into yet, but I would imagine is in the cards for us, is going and trying to get people to actually build their online presence on top of ICN, or NDN in particular, and then running into a problem where something like an ICANN model would have really helped them. So we have this namespace policy mechanism to really sort of deflect that problem and really court a lot of interest. Where do we want to go with this? So we have a bunch of starting points. We have a bunch of things that are basically to us existence proofs. But what we want to do is really want to uh, solidify this, turn this into real deployable solutions, and start their evaluation process. So deploying this, getting it out there, building it into something real, and actually seeing how it works, I think that's what really needs to happen next. I mean. I think there's a very interesting roadmap that we already have to show that there's some efficacy here. But I think demonstrating it, evaluating it, understanding it, and actually getting it some press is really, really important. Getting some user studies, getting it in some hands, seeing it actually survive in an attack, seeing it actually help with the dispute process, making it easier for someone to say, sure, I run this, I run this, this internet property. I'm willing to do it in NDN2 because you've given me a path to believe that my business will be protected. And then use the discussions that we get from talking to people about how we've evaluated our, our, our work to find new use cases, to find new problems that take us in new directions. Oop. And so with that, I'll take any questions or comments or rocks or bricks or rotten tomatoes. So who would you think would be the right place to manage these names for in the end? So you, you still think I can would be the, the right place? I think that is a starting point that makes sense because I think there's a lot of machinery there and there's a lot of momentum and there's a lot of money there. And so I think trying to up, upend it might be, might be a, a bit of a task, but I think that there's no reason that it can't work for us too. So one of the questions I got at, at the NCOM was, 
couldn't we have an unstructured portion of the namespace that doesn't have to be under that purview? And you know, we had some back and forth and there was some follow on email, but the, the long and short of it is, sure, you could have like slash local. And if you really wanted to do something there, then you probably don't have to. But you could have your companies feel safe that under like slash com or slash Amazon or slash Ninja, they'd be okay. In ICANN today, <clears throat> what are some of the challenges for IP namespace management? They're, they're legion. <laughs> they're enormous. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, it, it's, a, it's a much bigger community than I've got my, my head wrapped around. So I can only tell you about the walks that I've sort of seen in there. But they range from, so there's a government advisory council where you know governments send representatives to go to ICANN so that they can sort of liaise between you all are doing this, but these are our local jurisdictional concerns. Um, I'm actually a vice chair on the uh, review team for the second review team for security, stability, and resiliency. So our job is to be an oversight function to look at ICANN to see are you promoting proper security, stability, and resiliency for the portion of the internet that you are a curator of, and um, that gives us a lot of view of a lot of things that are happening in ICANN, but definitely not all of it. And you know, we've we've seen some concerns about the way things are going. But it's also given us a lot of exposure to just how many moving parts there are to how does a name get from the, your head to your keyboard to into a registry somewhere and how does that happen without anyone else taking it from you and you taking it from someone else and then how do you deal with disputes getting an intellectual property organization they have stakeholder groups for that um, it, it winds up being dizzying and so that's one of the reasons why I think if we were to not take a close look at that or take a close look at how we would use it, that we're going to inherit the exact same problems and need to have an organization or a community like that ourselves. So yeah, I think if somebody wants to make money off of a name because they're a company, mm -hmm. then they're going to want to protect it. And how you do that across the whole world would be asking for another NTIA green paper. Mm -hmm.